Hello, I am very excited to be here with you all today. I am uh, excited, uh, waiting for our special guest today, uh, Cynthia Turlo, to join us uh, and talk to us all about, uh, you know, uh, all about her amazing specialty in fasting and in nutrition. She is a, uh, a nurse practitioner and an expert on intermittent fasting. And uh, we're just really excited to uh, welcome her here today. So um, I am watching for her in our waiting room. Uh, I'd love to take a look here and see all of uh, these great faces that have joined us today. Lots of good friends and new faces here as well. So uh, I'd love to hear from you in the chat. Where are you all calling in from? And uh, let me know, uh, you know, what you're interested in hearing about today from uh, from from Cynthia uh, as a nurse practitioner and someone who is an expert in intermittent fasting. Uh, I think you know we have a lot of ground to cover as she arrives there. So hello, Ginger. Oh, great, Toronto, and all sorts of of folks in the house. Very excited to see you all here. Um, yes, and a show of hands too, just a little, uh, put your hands up if you uh, are someone who uh, is, is someone who is already uh, intermittent fasting as we uh, get into our conversation today. I will say that I uh, am personally, I, you know, I do a form of fasting, uh, you know, I think I didn't go there uh, in a specified way. I started to kind of recognize that um, I didn't really want breakfast. And so I just kind of kept sort of moving it back and um, ended up finding a spot where I felt really good and energized and could also control that next meal that I ate. Uh, so, you know, just really, um, you know, enjoying sort of creating my own sort of intermittent fasting, if you will, uh, outline, which I wouldn't even call it fasting because it's really just about me figuring out uh, how to eat more when I'm actually hungry versus when the clock says I should be eating or when, uh, you know, um, you know, I have an opening or anything like that. So uh, yes. Um, yeah. And yeah, I know people hear a lot about intermittent fasting. Um, so, you know, it is something that um, is a very hot topic right now. So I am uh, you know, really excited to kind of dig in on it today. Um, so we are uh, awaiting Cynthia. And as she gets here, hello, Mary in Ohio. We've got North Carolina with Ann Girardi in Michigan and New York City, Marlene Arvan, great to see you. Um, you know, wonderful, um, uh, you know, uh, great group of folks here. Uh, as we as we wait for this. So um, thinking about, you know, uh, intermittent fasting, I, I'm excited to have this conversation in that, um, you know, I always look at things through the lens of diet mentality, right? And I think that intermittent fasting came up and really kind of made its way into our consciousness and as everything, it always seems to make its way into some sort of diet mentality uh, and some sort of uh, a magic bullet, if you will, right? Like something that, oh, if I just do this, everything will fall into place. So I kind of want to really um, think about how, you know, you know, how, you know, just tell me even in the chat, like as you heard about intermittent fasting, was it in relation to weight loss? Um, what were the things that people in your sphere or what you took in from external resources did you think intermittent fasting really meant? I'd really love to hear from you all. Um, and uh, I'm just going to text and see um, if uh, she's going to be joining. Um, and we'll see what we can get going. If not, guys, we'll have a great um, so, oh my goodness, um, I am just getting messages wondering where Cynthia was, uh, saying that she can't join us today. So she is, um, 
she's coming in on uh, the on the on the line. Sorry, guys. Uh, and she's gonna come in. She is coming in in about five minutes. Um, so uh, she'll be here any second. So I will keep vamping. So let me check your chat comments here. Okay. It's a way to decrease overall calorie intake and decrease the need for food choices. Yes. Um, giving your, your time, body time to rest and not participate in eating. Yep. Kind of get it through, let it digest through all of, um, of the, uh, uh, you know, all of the, um, the food get all the way down. Uh, it does, it can balance that insulin response. Excellent. So, oh, good. So we've heard, you know, it, in related, uh, in um, a new, uh, in many, many ways. So good. Well, so, so that's going to be a big part of our, our conversation today. Um, but also, um, you know, this sort of mind body connection and this, um, you know, balancing that. And I love to talk about that in this, the, again, I like to think through the, um, you know, especially in the intermittent fasting world, you know, I was, not looking to do intermittent fasting, but I was looking to connect more to my mind. So, um, oh, good. Cynthia is here. I see you there. Awesome. Let's get you in here. Wonderful. Hi, Cynthia. Hey, how are you? And I should have my camera on. I don't see me talking though. So I can see you. I just can't see you, your face. I, we can hear you. And hmm. we can't see you on video. Yeah, I use Zoom all the time, so I'm not sure why. I don't even have my camera. It's not even an option. I don't know if it's because I came through the link that the participants came through, and probably, why. probably, um, probably uh, needed to come through sort of a panelist link. Um, but that's exactly what I did. Um, oh. I mean, at this point, it doesn't matter. But um, you're here. You're here. We can hear you. Yes. I was hoping to see your great face. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm, yeah, the link that was shared with us, uh, the only option I had was to join Let's through the link that, that was shared. Down. Let's see if that works. There she is. Yeah, no, I, I just, it's always a whole lot easier when people can see you when you're speaking as opposed to just hearing a voice from beyond. Sorry about the uh, technical things. I have a, a new admin on my team and she's just not on top of things this morning, so. <laughs> okay, it's okay. It's, you know, just keeps it, it keeps it real, honestly. So I was it is just- really real. I was just vamping and, you know, really excited. I've been very, very excited to meet you and, and talk to you and uh, connect. I feel like um, just having you here is a real blessing today. So I'm oh, glad that Well, thank you. I've been looking forward to our conversation as well. Yeah. Um, well, so guys, if you don't um, know Cynthia, um, you know, I want to kind of just give you a, a brief, a brief introduction, but then honestly, uh, really let you give uh, my my followers really a little bit of, of an idea of who you are. Um, I've enjoyed so much getting to know you as my treadmill buddy in the morning, listening to all of your amazing <laughs> podcasts and just getting to know you so that I could have an intelligent conversation with you today. Um, we had connected on social media uh, some time ago, and you just strike me as someone who is going to be a real valuable asset and resource to uh, the Target 100 community who is always trying, honestly, to just make a small change that impacts them and to be educated. That's really what we do here is try to connect people with really strong resources and um, help them make that next best step and change in their lives. So, um, so Cynthia is a nurse practitioner and an intermittent fasting and nutrition expert. Um, you are a two-time TEDx speaker and your passion is in finding, helping women find wellness through the healing power of nutrition and fasting. Uh, my favorite thing that you say in your small bio though, is that you believe it's possible to feel better tomorrow than you do today. Uh, so that really speaks to the work we do here as well, which is like these, these could be very small changes that really truly actually impact you as soon as tomorrow. So I love that. 
So would you share just a little bit about your background and why you do what you do so so that the folks that are listening can get a, a, a feel for who you are. Additionally, this is a live webinar and I'm always a very interactive person. So the chat is on, I'll be watching it. People, if they feel like asking questions, I'll be monitoring that and we'll bring them to you. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to connect with your community and my apologies to the watchers. It is not my norm not to be well prepared, but I realized uh, about five minutes before I was to jump on that I didn't have the proper links and there was a communication glitch on my team. So my apologies for getting things started a little bit later than we had originally anticipated. My whole background is in ER medicine and cardiology. I was an ER nurse in inner city Baltimore. Uh, I transitioned effortless, effortlessly to becoming an, a nurse practitioner in cardiology, and I did that for over 20 years. And I grew increasingly frustrated with our traditional allopathic medical model, largely because we wait for our patients to get disease before we really start fine-tuning the lifestyle piece. And I became increasingly more passionate about the role of nutrition and wellness and strategies that patients could do lifelong, as opposed to the latest potion pillar powder and so six years ago, I took a massive leap, uh, leap of faith and left clinical medicine to become an entrepreneur without a business plan, which I don't recommend. But the reason why this is really relevant was that I felt like I could make a larger impact, even as an introvert, uh, not being constrained to seeing patients in the hospital or in clinic. And so initially I started attracting women that were much like I was middle-aged feeling that our needs were not being met in the current medical system. And largely they are not because most women in perimenopause are offered the following, oral contraceptives, an IUD, an ablation, or a hysterectomy. And I told my GYN, time out, I'm not willing to do this. And so I started attracting women, much like myself, who really were looking for lifestyle-mediated alterations to improve their metabolic health and overall wellness. And uh, as an introvert, I decided to do a TED Talk in 2018, because that was a bright, that was a scary goal, right? It was something safe and scary. Uh, and that ultimately led to two TED Talks and then one that went viral and the rest is history. And so I really have been able to impact more women's lives by leaving clinical medicine, but I'm always very grateful for uh, the years that I, I spent delivering care to patients in that traditional model. But now I get to do really cool things like connect with you and do podcasts and be able to travel and, and impact more people. So a lot of what I'm known for is intermittent fasting and metabolic health. And I'm really happy to be able to serve as a voice for women, because if I didn't know what to expect and the changes that were coming in my own body, then I know most women don't either. And the kind of traditional way of putting a Band-Aid on our symptoms is not the way to navigate the second half of our lives. And so my hope is always to inspire and empower and educate women to be able to make informed decisions and, and, and informed consent if they do decide to proceed with any of the things I talked about, any of those options that were made available to me in my early 40s. Um, and it's not to suggest it might not be the right decision for someone, but understanding the full ramifications of their decisions. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Well, so it's, it's so wonderful, you know, as I say, our whole goal here is to educate and empower. And I think that that is the exciting part about the world that we live in now, the fact that we could connect this way, mm -hmm. uh, like-minded, I feel very aligned with so much of what it is that you're, that you're teaching and um, just hope to kind of pick your brain a little bit today. Um, you know, I think for a lot of the folks that are, are listening, we were chatting just before you came on, I was, I was asking people, you know, Oftentimes, I'm, I run a weight loss business where we lead with weight loss, but really what we're teaching is transformation that leads mm -hmm. to weight loss, not weight loss leading to transformation. And so we were talking about the fact that intermittent fasting has gotten very popular in the diet and weight loss world, and that many people, that's their only real relationship to it is like, oh, I think it's a weight loss tool. Right. And so they go into it with diet mentality saying, OK, I heard I have to do X and Y. I have to eat between this time and that time. But as long as I'm doing that, I can eat whatever I want and I'm going to lose this magical weight. Right. Again, a magical pill or potion. So I just thought it would be really wonderful to hear from you as an expert, just the grounding principles around what how do you define intermittent fasting? What do you, you know, just your, your spiel on the whole, the whole thing. 
Yeah. And I, I love that you bring up the fact that many men and women, you know, it's not unique to women, but many people come to intermittent fasting for a desire to lose weight or change body composition. And I always say that they stay for all the other benefits, maybe the things they didn't realize that really make them feel good, have more energy. When I think about intermittent fasting, it's as easy as saying eat less often. The conventional prevailing wisdom that we have embedded into our patients for years and years and years is eat to stoke your metabolism. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Um, calories in, calories out. And I always like to remind people that intermittent fasting dates back to biblical times. It is not new or novel. In fact, we wouldn't be here as a species if we couldn't intermittent fast or we couldn't go through periods of time with famine and feasting. And unfortunately, over the last 50, 60, 70 years, the processed food industry has convinced us that we can't go more than a few hours without eating, that we need those convenience foods at every gas station and every airport, because God forbid we go more than a few hours without eating. So when I think about fasting as a strategy, it's eating less often. That could look different for each one of us. I always say that you know, women at peak fertile years, you know, 35 and under need to fast differently than perimenopausal women 10 to 15 years prior to menopause than menopausal women. And I always say menopausal women and men are in one bucket. Like it's a whole lot easier for them because they don't have as much fluctuating hormones day to day, week to week, like the rest of us do that are still getting cycles. So when I think about fasting, it's the eating less often piece, because I find that's less triggering. The word fasting can be triggering. So I just say eat less often. That seems very benign. Um, but it, it can be as simple as, you know, kind of the graduated approach when I'm talking about it is stop snacking. You know, as soon as we are not snacking in between meals, we are forced to reproportion our protein, fat and macronutrient or protein, fat and carbs. And we'll actually have an appreciation of what it feels like to feel satiated after a meal, because we're going to realize I'm not eating for four or five hours in between, but getting back to your original question. When I'm thinking about fasting, it's really helping men and women understand that we are tapping into the intrinsic nature that our bodies are designed to be very aligned with, that our bodies are comfortable going several hours, four to five hours in between meals, because it allows our body to use different types of fuel. Our body can use glucose. It can also use fatty acids and understanding that that is, that is an efficiency in our bodies. But when we're eating all the time and we're eating all day long, we're drinking sugary beverages all day long, guess what happens? Not only does it erode that metabolic flexibility, but it also you know, makes us prone to developing insulin resistance. Um, it makes us prone to metabolic disease. And I find for many people, they don't make those associations because that's what we've been conditioned to believe. It can be very hard to kind of go against prevailing dogmatic principles. And even worse yet, when healthcare providers are telling our patients this and we're listening and going along with the rhetoric, probably everyone here has heard their patient, their parent, their provider tell them, exercise more, eat less. How many times did that come out of my mouth? Way before I realized that was just terrible, terrible information to give our patients because they then feel powerless when it doesn't work. And so, you know, from my perspective, when we talk about the fasting piece, people come do it out of a desire to lose weight or change body composition. They stay because they're much more mentally clear. They have more energy. They're no longer hangry. And probably many of us know I have teenagers. One gets hangry just like he did when he was a toddler. And it's like mind blowing yeah. that he doesn't make the connection between low blood sugar and his behavior. That's a whole separate conversation. I was going to say, but, I have two teenage boys and I'm living oh, yeah. their life right now. It's yeah, yeah. Yeah. 17 and 15, the 17 year old never gets hangry. The 15 year old does. And that's, you know, then it, you totally understand where I am, but it's interesting. People realize being hangry is not normal, that it's not normal to be weight loss resistant. It is not normal to not have enough energy to go from meal to meal. And it's not normal to be dependent on caffeine and sugar to be able to get through your day. And I'm sure you probably see this too in your work. How many women tell me they have a double cappuccino in the afternoon and a candy bar because they are so tired after eating their lunch, they need a pick me up. And so I, I think a lot of what fasting teaches us is that we can fast for different reasons. I find most people stick with fasting because they feel so much better. They're alleviated with the concern of having to carry snacks. They don't have to worry about if they are out running errands and they suddenly get hungry. They know their body knows what to do. And so I, I find for many people, it's very freeing 
And it's also very validating that our bodies intrinsically are really designed to function very, very efficiently, but we've conditioned ourselves otherwise. I, I love this. And I, I like this idea around it. Thank you for bringing that up. It's, you know, I do learn, see this a lot is that we have conditioned ourselves so much that that feeling of getting hungry mm-hmm. is panic inducing for many people. And so that feeling of anxiety has been conditioned in that, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to get so hungry. I'm going to get hangry mm-hmm. and something bad is going to happen. And, you know, sort of like you're saying, like, I, you know, feel, oh, I wish I had given that advice earlier in my career. I always say I am like uh, here to like undo all the diet mentality that I taught at earlier in my life (laughs) than try to free people from it. And that is that piece of, you know, we joke about it. I'm like, do you know, you can actually, if, if you were pushed to go, you could go 30 days without eating food. You can't go two days without water, but if, if all things like fell apart, so if you don't have that snack, can we go back to this sort of funny idea that makes you giggle? Like, wait, I think I'm going to make it home to dinner without this snack. But, and I'm making light of something that is actually very emotional for people and has a deep rooted connection to anxiety and fear and worry. And like, what will happen to me if I go further down this road? So I love that you're talking about the learning process. How does someone go into how does someone you know begin to stretch those muscles or play with those with those boundaries it's a great question and I think for each one of us we have different relationships with food some of us may view food just as fuel that's probably not as as common but I think for many of us and the last two and a half years haven't been easy for most people we lean into food as a an emotional crutch we we use it as a way to not deal with uncomfortable feelings There's a great colleague of mine, Dr. Joan Rosenberg, and she has this book um, that talks about these uncomfortable feelings and how each one of us have ways of masking, not wanting to deal with the uncomfortable feeling. And sometimes it's over-exercising, overeating. Maybe people are leaning into drugs and alcohol, et cetera, but it's really the, the lack of wanting to deal with the painful stuff can sometimes lead us to have disordered relationships. And so anytime someone's doing something new, I tell them it's going to feel uncomfortable for a period of time, even if it's as simple as I put myself to bed an hour earlier. I mean, that's where I think a lot of women struggle. If I say to them, I really think you need to go to bed a little earlier. Oh, but then I can't do this and I can't. And I was like, think about what you gain, not what you're losing. And so when we're working on lifestyle changes, I always say, think about what you're gaining, not what you're losing. And so I always suggest doing one thing at a time. When I was first doing this work as an entrepreneur, I would give my my clients or patients, a very long list with good intention. Well, what happened 99.9% of the time, the client felt overwhelmed and then they felt like they couldn't do anything. So now we pick like one nutrition thing, one lifestyle thing. Maybe it's, you know, I'm going to walk for 10 minutes after every meal. I'm going to eat an an additional green vegetable every day. And I'm going to try to go to bed 30 minutes earlier. I mean, that is more tangible than a list of things. And so I always say master one thing before we add in something else, much the same reason if it's not about fasting, maybe it's nutrition and people who, if I suggest doing an elimination diet, that feels really overwhelming and uncomfortable. And so I say, okay, we're going to pull the band, we're going to rip the bandit off. Let's get rid of gluten. And then you're going to be forced to get creative with your meals and you're going to eat less processed foods. And so I feel like, you know, it's this domino effect once someone gets one win, then it usually dominoes into another. But if we give too much advice and it's always done in the context of wanting to be helpful, but someone that's, that's really mired in a lot of unhealthy lifestyle choices, it's very hard to imagine, you know, living a a healthier lifestyle. So one thing at a time is usually reasonable and feasible and trying to give too much, you know, well-intentioned advice up front can make things really tough. And there might be a unicorn. Like I always say, there's always a unicorn. There's someone that can do that all effortlessly, but that's not the norm. And that's not human nature. It's hard for us to make changes. And oftentimes it's three to four weeks making that change before it feels comfortable. And maybe you're less conscious of it, but up until then, it's all this imprinting that you're doing in your brain. You know, we're building on, you know, I love the word neuroplasticity, but when we do new things, 
um, it, it's important for us to understand like our brain is, is adapting to the changes and it's actually something that's, you know, it's a form of hormesis or beneficial stress. It is stressful, but it's designed to kind of make us stronger and more resilient. And so if I reframe it that way, I find it is much less overwhelming than if I just give someone 50 things to do. And then they're like, I don't even know where to start. Yeah. Oh, you're speaking our language. I mean, this is what we do at Target 100. And, and, and then layer on top of it, the idea of habit formation, which I think is really where you're going with this sort of like, it takes these three weeks. Um, and there is that, you know, I wrote about it in the book is that, that not a lot of people talk about what that, that discomfort feels like. And that that discomfort is actually a sign that you're doing great. You're doing great. You're, you're, you are, you're challenging yourself um, to, you know, really, um, stretch that, stretch that thinking and that neuroplasticity that you're talking about, I think is so important. We, t- we talk a lot about curiosity and the idea of it, when you are making a small change that there's a lot of brain science coming out right now that especially adult humans cease to be curious after a certain, a certain age. And that if we can reinstate curiosity around these changes and say, I'm curious what it feels like to to drop my snacks for three days. I'm just curious to see what that feels like. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be the you know, end all. It's not for the rest of my life. I just really wonder what that would feel like. That they can actually go much, much, much further as they as they expand and work this neuroplasticity. So I love that we're that we're getting into this brain science piece. Well, and I think it's really important, um, irrespective of what title you have or what job role you have, that we're lifelong learners. I say all the time, I mean, I I trained at arguably one of the best medical institutions in the world. And let me be the first person to tell everyone, even though that happened, I had that education, I had to start questioning what I knew. And so I was raised that way. I probably drove my parents crazy, but I was always a questioner. I was always someone who didn't necessarily accept the status quo. And I'm so grateful that that I'm that way because I'm innately curious about the world. And I encourage women to be the same and men for that matter. Like I'm always reading. I love listening to podcasts. Um, The book that I, I couldn't send the message to everyone, 90 Seconds to a Life You Love is Dr. Joan Rosenberg's um, work. I have it on Audible and I listen to it at least once a month, I'll listen to a chapter because it's always relevant. Um, And I know her personally as well. And I just, I I think she's absolutely brilliant, but it really, it really like fine tunes, like those uncomfortable feelings they come up for all of us. But getting back to the original intent of what you were saying, I think all of us have to remain intellectually curious throughout our lifetime. Um, I had the opportunity to spend time with a college friend a few weeks ago And I had said to her, I'm not the same person I was three years ago. We hadn't seen each other in five years, but I said, I'm not the same person that I was three years ago because I had gone through this lengthy hospitalization, had been very sick. And I I said, you know, if we don't adjust where we are, like if we get too comfortable, we're never going to grow. And so I think it's really important to grow and to be challenging ourselves. And it could be, it could be going to bed early 30 minutes, 30 minutes earlier every night. It could be that small or, you know, pushing yourself you know, learning about a topic that maybe before you wouldn't have been ready to learn about. Um, I'll give everyone an example. So I have a podcast, I have two podcasts, but one is Everyday Wellness. And this has been the year for me to read about trauma. And I trained at a hospital where trauma to us was big T, murder, rape, suicide, terrible things. There's more than that, that, you know, there's little T trauma. It's the little incremental things that we may deal with day to day or week to week. And so Gabor Mate is this like prolific trauma expert and I'm interviewing him and his book is really long. And I was saying to my husband, I can only read a couple chapters at a time, but it's important for me to understand this at a deeper level. So for everyone that's watching, um, you know, be a reader. And if you don't like to read, like listen to the book. And if you prefer listening to podcasts, do that too. But whether it's doing puzzles or um, learning a language, I mean, it's really important for our brains it's really important, especially if you're middle-aged, it's really important to be learning new things. Cause you, you always say what wires together, fires together. So as you're learning new things, it's, you know, improving the quality of your neurons in your brain. And one thing that I know a lot of middle-aged women get worried about is as they're having these fluctuating hormones, what's the net impact on cognition and brain health. And so 
again, why I think it's so important just to keep being a lifelong learner. And it could be very different for each one of us. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking about, you know, as you're talking, I think it's really, it's important. I love this idea. We talked in our title around this, around that sort of mind body connection. And I think this, that's sort of where we're edging in this conversation is around the fact that, you know, there's this metabolic flexibility, there's neuroplasticity, these things work together, right? And that the more that you have of each of them, the better off you will be and the better you will age. So, you know, I'm thinking about the lifelong learner for sure, learning and doing things that I'm thinking about you doing a TED talk and what that must have taken and how you had to prepare and take the steps to get you to that ultimate place, right? We think about things like that, writing a book or doing a TED talk, and we're able to see them in this very, you know, I'm going to do this systematic sort of breakdown of things, and I'm going to learn about it, and I'm going to think about how do I write it, and how do I practice it, and how do I, then, but then when we come over to the health side or to especially coming from our side of the weight loss, there are so, so many emotions and so much guilt and shame around this process. And we stop seeing it as something that is as interesting and ever-changing, our bodies, our minds, and, and again, kind of getting in there and saying, okay, how do I feel when I do Wordle every morning or when I do um, take Tai Chi, where I start to actually really connect the fact that by moving my body in certain ways, I actually end up feeling much clearer during the day, that there is actual connectivity going on there. So can you share a little bit more uh, of your perspective there? Yeah. And I, I think when we're really speaking to is finding balance between, you know, we can talk about left brain being analytical and right brain being more emotional, but I think it's deeper than that. I think about this autonomic nervous system where we have the sympathetic, I'm being chased by a rabid animal and the parasympathetic, which is the rest and repose side of our brains. And in order to digest our food, have an orgasm, be relaxed, we really have to be in the parasympathetic, but most of us are so task oriented. We're so fixated on the to-do list and rushing from one thing to another and not really being present, not really being disconnected from technology. Um, I'll give everyone an example. So I alluded to like three years ago, I spent all this time in the hospital and you know, you spend 13 days in the hospital, you get pretty introspective at some point. And I said to myself, when, if I if I leave this, when I leave this hospital, um, this is what I'm doing differently for the rest of my life. And uh, I have really leaned into that. And so, uh, you know, an adrenaline junkie, ER nurse, cardiology, loves emergencies, loves critically sick patients, loves being intellectually stimulated. That side of me is still present, but I make a very concerted effort every day to do specific things. As an example, I walk in nature every day with my dogs, generally with my husband. I do that at least twice a day. Um, you know, I meditate and I really, like I say to people all the time, like meditation is not five minutes once a week. Like you really do have to find things that you enjoy and lean into them. I do things for pleasure, which means I disconnect. Um, I love to take vacations with my family. I have a PEMF mat in my house. And the irony is I bought that and an infrared sauna. And the infrared sauna doesn't get used nearly as much as this mat. And so you can get on this mat um, and I'll talk about the technology yeah, behind it. Can you tell them what yeah. the Yeah. So, so this mat that I lie on, depending on the settings, can impact um, activating certain brain waves that are stimulating and certain ones that are very relaxing. So more often than not, my family laughs. I fall asleep on it at night because I'll do it before bed. But what it's designed to do, it's um, pulse electromagnetic frequency. And what it does is it's um, energizing for the cells. It impacts the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of our cells. I just find it really relaxing. I crave it. Like I may go to the gym, but I still want to get on that mat for 15 or 20 minutes before I take a shower. And my family thinks it's funny, but the joke's on them because it's my time. I'm totally disconnected. I just lie on this mat and I'm not suggesting you have to go. I I'm a kind of a biohacker. I love gadgets, but it could be as simple as sitting outside for 10 minutes in the morning, getting sunlight on your retinas, which is reminding your body that you are suppressing cortisol, excuse me, suppressing melatonin, increasing cortisol, you're getting your day started. That is the one gift of the pandemic that I talk about a lot is that I get out in nature every day. I crave it, I need it. 
Um, you know, we moved from a very busy part of the country to a less populated part of our state. Best decision ever. Everyone's happier, less traffic, people are nicer. No one's in a rush to go anywhere, which is part of the other side of my, my brain. I'm like, move. I grew up in New Jersey. We don't drive slowly at all. <laughs> the reason why this is important is find some way to honor your body every day. Because we know if we look at the science, we know we become less stress resilient as we get older. And that is a byproduct of the changes in hormonal fluctuations as we go through reverse puberty. So this is starting in your late thirties. I have women tell me all the time, I'm 50. I still get my period. Well, that's great. Statistically, 51 is the average age of menopause in the United States. So you're close. You're like knocking on the door. Um, and it's nothing to be a fair, fearful or afraid of. But understanding the way that our bodies become less stress resilient as we get older means sleep is important. Stress management is not five minutes of meditation once a week, anti-inflammatory nutrition, the right types of exercise. And let me be clear, I'm not suggesting you do everything all at once. I usually say sleep is the first thing we work on because it's so important for blood sugar regulation, balancing leptin and ghrelin, which are these appetite and satiety hormones. It's important for sleep quality. And we understand that in the brain, there's this lymphatic system that's like the waste and recycling process in the body. And it doesn't get activated properly if we don't get good sleep. So understand that sleep is, for me, is always the foundational principle under which everything else that we walk around. But getting back to the, your original question, um, finding ways to honor your body every day, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Like some people say, I would rather... I would rather, you know, take 15 seconds of a cold shower at the very end of my shower than lay on a mat or go to the gym right now. But I can handle the 15 seconds. I remember what I talked about hormesis is this beneficial stress. It's good for us on many, many levels, but understanding that there's that body brain connection that's really strong, especially when we challenge our bodies, like with fasting, certain types of exercise, cold exposure, you know, jokingly, I told my husband, I don't need to take a cold shower right now. I just need to do outside with a lighter layer of clothing when, when we walk the dogs, because I'm cold. I'm like, okay, this is where yeah. he's exactly, yeah. exactly. So it may look a little different for everyone. Yeah. I love that. I've discovered yoga during the pandemic, which I, I, mean, I feel like we were separated at birth. I'm like, <laughs> like, you know, task oriented, had a very big shift in life. And yoga was this big thing. And I always say, I do the yoga for the Shavasana, which is like, yes, yes. When in your life do you just lay on Surrender. the ground, right? And just get grounded, like truly lay on the ground. We don't do it. And again, as, as adult humans, we never just lay on the ground and surrender and let the earth hold us up. And that there's something so peaceful in that. And it sets a tone for my day. So I'm not there for the yoga. I'm there for the Shavasana. No, no. It's funny that you say that because uh, we're in this new city and I haven't been able to find a place that does the kind of yoga I used to do in my other city. Everything is very hot here. Like when I say hot, it's Ashtanga yoga hot. And it just, it's, I, I'm in a humid part of the country the thought of being in a really, really, really hot room does not appeal to me at this stage. I'm like, I need more yin yoga. I need more, you know, like gear me down yoga. And the Shavasana was always, I was the person that fell asleep during Shavasana. My, my instructor would always like come and touch my foot. She'd be like, we're all done now. I'm like, great, great. I'm like, oh, I'm totally asleep. It was wonderful. Do I have it's blissful. To go? <laughs> Do I have yeah. To? Yeah. Uh, well, so, um, so yeah, so this, the connection and the mind body connection and all of it as as you were going through it I mean so many of our pillars are aligned and and sleep is one of our power pillars and I always you know I'm like you I I just anecdotally a lot of my women it's almost like a FOMO piece of like I don't want to go to bed I don't want to go to bed what if I miss out on this or I want to watch this extra show or I want to get time to scroll through this or you know so so sleep I love hearing from you yet again, just reiterating that we are on the right track here to be working ha habit formation around those sleep patterns. So important. Then the fasting piece, I just kind of want to return to it for a second, because I think there was, I was listening to a, 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 a podcast that you did, and then we're, the, a, a, an ad came on for electrolytes. And I was like, you know, I think that's, that would be a great thing to sort of educate people around you know, we talk about hydration at Target 100. We have hydration, we have movement, we have exercise, we have sleep, we have stress, and of course, nutrition as our six pillars. And we're working in habit formation and all of those. 
And as people are beginning to think about, you know, fasting, and I love the way you frame this, I want to kind of repeat this for people. It's like, fasting could be as small as saying, I'm not going to have a snack, mm -hmm. right? It does not have to be that you jump to a 16-8 or, you mm -hmm. know, whatever it is that, that you're hearing about. Um, so it could be this baby step in. But I just thought, you know, that could be a really interesting, you know, could you define for you what that means also? Like, is it no food? I get a lot of questions around, I had coffee. Does that mean I broke my fast if there was cream in the coffee? Does it, you just kind of do like a little primer for us on what is fasting and what electrolytes, why you recommend and take electrolytes yourself. Yeah. So fasting is eating less often. And I really, I think about 12 hours is digestive rest. So if you don't eat from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., that's digestive rest. Fasting's, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 plus hours without going with food. But it's important to define what a clean fast is. So I'm a purist and I do fervently believe that you're going to get the best results from fasting if you are abiding by not ingesting food or sugar or cream during a fast. So uh, a, a clean fast is water with unflavored electrolytes. And I'll talk about electrolytes in a second. Uh, bitter coffee or bitter tea. Now, most Americans are very, their palates are very sensitized for sweet. So bitter, they don't like bitter. And so I remind them, we don't want to consume things that are going to evoke an insulin response. And insulin is not a bad hormone. It gets a bad rap. Insulin is, is secreted in response to food and beverage consumption in most instances. Um, and it's highly dependent on what we eat. So if you eat a, a plate of pasta, you're going to get a larger blood sugar response and result in insulin response to bring your blood sugar down versus fat and proteins kind of in the middle. But when we're talking about a clean fast, I encourage people to consume bitter coffee. You can add high quality salt like Redmond salt, or you can add cinnamon, which will increase insulin sensitivity, neither of which will break your fast or bitter teas. Now that is a clean fast. Now you'll see people, you know, it's a little bit of the bro science on social media. Oh, you can have uh, butter in your coffee. You can have cream in your coffee. Of course you can, but those are insulinemic, meaning that you will evoke an insulin response in conjunction with consuming those foods. So as long as you understand what they're doing, I always say, if you need a fatty coffee, have it during your feeding window or, uh, you know, that that's kind of the methodology, but electrolytes are very important. More often than not, when I'm talking about beginning an intermittent fasting regimen, I'm really encouraging people, especially if they're metabolically inflexible, if they're obese and overweight to limit their carbohydrates. Now, let me stress, it doesn't mean no carbohydrates. We get carbohydrates from green leafy vegetables. We get them from low glycemic berries, tart apples, et cetera. I'm really talking about sugary beverages and um, highly processed, hyper palatable carbohydrates a lot of the junk that's out there, you know, just insert that because those are the things that are contributing to the insulin resistance, the weight loss resistance, et cetera. So when someone is new to fasting, I generally encourage them to monitor or track their macros. I really like chronometer because it also breaks down the micronutrients as well as the protein, fat, and carbs. And that can be helpful, but specifically for protein and carbohydrates, lower the carbs, increase the protein. This has been, this is what's worked very well because Higher protein consumption will help with satiety. Lower carbohydrate consumption will help with releasing some of the stored glycogen that's in our muscles. Um, and for many people that are metabolically inflexible and have fatty liver, going lower carbohydrate, we know based on lots and lots of research has profound metabolic benefits. But when you are losing these stored glycogen or stored sugar, you are losing water. And what goes with water? Sodium. And this is why if you are fasting, you must use electrolytes because you are losing not just sodium and chloride and potassium and magnesium, but these things can actually evoke some of the quote unquote side effects. They call it keto flu. It's really a byproduct of being dehydrated. You get headaches, you have muscle aches, you feel crappy, you're nauseous. That is because your body has lost a lot of electrolytes. So the best practice with fasting is if you are fasting, you're replacing electrolytes. And no, this does not mean sprinkling a little bit of salt on your food. That's not gonna give it to you. You really do have to have a high quality product. And obviously there are a couple brands that I, I'm very aligned with, but I always say when you're in an unfed state, when you're fasted, it's unflavored during your feeding window, things like Element or Redmond's, they both make high quality products. Um, they do have stevia in them. 
And so obviously we could have a whole tangential conversation on stevia. However, I think of that as being a bit more benign than sucralose, aspartame. And we could talk about non-nutritive sweeteners for hours, but yeah, uh, from my per- yeah. <laughs> for, from my perspective, just understanding that electrolytes and intermittent fasting go together in a beautiful synergy. You don't want to do one without the other. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a reason that people may do it and then actually not actually continue with it, whatever that means, you know, like for them, whatever that fasting window ends up looking like. So um, adding in these really high quality, right. And, and, a, and a little bit of, of a little bit of flavor, but you know, something that will keep the potassium, the magnesium, the sodium mm-hmm. all uh, in the body. So very important. So I'm glad that they're hearing that, that from you. Um, you mentioned um, protein. And I thought, you know, it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about what it is that you're recommending people are eating during their fasting window. Because as I said, oftentimes it's been portrayed that as long as I'm in the window, I can kind of have anything I want. Um, But I think evolving from that place, right, which I think there's an evolution that takes Mm -hmm. place. and, And even just walking down this road and saying, I might drop a snack after today and see if I'm curious how that feels. Um, what, you know, the, the thing that I see, again, from the majority of my patients, mainly females, is that protein is the last thing that they really want to eat. And no, I, 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 I on protein and, and inspire people. Yes. <laughs> um, I will be the first person to maybe to say to this group, protein is the most important macronutrient for a variety of reasons. Um, Protein is the most satiating macronutrient. Um, Protein is critically important for satiety. It is critically important to help maintain muscle mass. Maybe you may or may not know about this, but our peak bone and muscle mass is in our twenties and thirties. So by the time we're 40, we are losing muscle mass. Why is this significant? Because if we're losing muscle, we are losing insulin sensitivity. This is further exacerbated with the changes that occur in perimenopause into menopause, where we're losing a particular hormone called estrogen. And estrogen is intricately involved with muscle protein synthesis, as well as fat deposition. So the example I like to use is young muscle looks like a filet. It's mostly muscle. Older muscle sadly, this includes all of us that are middle-aged, looks more like a ribeye, unless you are actually actively working against this mechanism. And this means you have to eat enough protein. And I'll talk about that in a second. You have to lift weights and maybe it starts with body weight exercises, but lifting weights is critically important for maintaining metabolic health and you need to sleep. So typically what I see with middle-aged women is they eat too many carbs too many of the wrong types of fats. And by that, I mean, seed oils and read food labels. If you do nothing else, you'll realize how much seed oils are in everything. The most common consumed fat in the United States right now is soybean oil, which is a crime, an absolute crime. And then lastly, they don't eat enough protein. Now, animal protein is superior to plant-based protein. I know that that can be triggering and upsetting, but that is just, if you look at the amino acid uh, composition of a piece of meat versus uh, you know, a, a cup of edamame, it's, it's very different. And so I always am very upfront. I always say, listen, plant-based protein is, is fine, but if you're already metabolically unhealthy and you're obese and overweight, you have to be conscientious about the, the, the types of carbohydrates you're consuming. And a lot of the plant-based proteins are very carb dense. So just something to consider when I'm talking to women about a minimum threshold for carb, excuse me, minimum threshold for protein consumption. I've had a lot of public talks this week. Um, one very, very big one yesterday. Um, and I'm a little tongue tied the minimum amount of protein women should be aiming for. And this is usually when people like fall on the floor, a (laughs) hundred grams of protein a day, because they'll say, how do I get that in, in a feeding window? And I always say two meals per day minimum for women. So I don't like OMAD for women as a sustained option. That's one meal a day two good sized portions of protein. So if you're currently consuming 40 or 50 grams of protein, guess what? I'm going to encourage you to have more with each meal. And it, it's not going to happen overnight. It may take a couple months. I now consume 50 to 60 grams of protein with each meal I eat. That's not where it started. Just to, for the people that are listening. Um, so the yeah. Wrap their yeah. Yeah. I mean, so yesterday when I broke my fast, I had 
half, so I, I had two bison burgers that was about half a pound of bison. And then I had, I think two or three hard boiled eggs, which I'm obsessed with. I'm going through a stage right now with hard boiled eggs. And then I had some salad with that. And that's what I had, but that's not where I started from. Let me be very clear. Yeah. I usually like to have complementary proteins. I eat a lot of eggs because I like the choline. Um, you, you know, for me, I like leaner proteins. That's what works well for my body. It might be different for other people. Maybe you can tolerate having a ribeye. Maybe having salmon doesn't bother you. I have to, I'm a little more sensitive to the fat content and protein. So a lot of it's bio-individual. What I generally recommend, and if you look at the research and there's uh, a colleague of mine and a very good friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, this is kind of her area of expertise. She talks about one gram per pound of ideal body weight. So I weigh 120 pounds. I'm just sharing this for comparison purposes. I eat no less than hundred grams of protein a day. That is what works for me. But I find for most women, they're so under eating protein. Once they start augmenting their macros, more protein, less carbs, they're satiated, their hunger cues are better aligned and they start to have some changes in body composition. And for many people, it's a lot to wrap their heads around because they've been eating so differently for so many years. I just find that the colleagues of mine that are happy with where they are in time and space are the ones that are eating, leaning into that protein piece. And uh, a lot of longevity researchers, so if we're talking about Walter Longo or looking at David Sinclair, you know, they're longevity researchers. They're not focused on losing, you know, metabolic flexibility per se. And so I always say there's a very fine line when you're looking at two different types of science right now and, and the metrics associated with those. For me, it's much more important for me to maintain metabolic flexibility by maintaining my muscle. And the way that I maintain my muscle as a middle-aged woman is lifting heavy things and hitting those protein macros. So for some people, um, you know, we talked about this at the very beginning, how do we start making those changes? Just aim for a little, maybe you eat four ounces of chicken right now. Maybe you aim for six and it's really that simple and slowly work your way up. Um, I don't eat as much as my teenage boys. Thank goodness. Yeah. But I definitely, I definitely lean into protein and, and it's amazing how, if you go to restaurants, depending on where you go, sometimes the protein portions, because protein is expensive. Sometimes the protein portions are tiny. Like I'll look at something, I'll go, can I get a side of like shrimp? Yeah. Well, and I'm <laughs> um, in the place now that we went out we actually ended up out for a steak dinner and my older son, my 17 year old, who's lifting a lot of heavy things, mm -hmm. very into bodybuilding, had two steaks. Yep. I was gonna, I was like, you're putting me out of business here. Like, I can't afford this. This is insane, but it's amazing. So I love this. I love, love, love this. I mean, Target 100 was always meant to be a, an opener for people, right? Let's just target 100 grams of carbohydrates a day, total carbs, right? Which all of a sudden move them away from processed foods, mm -hmm. move them into more fat and more protein in a super, super gentle way. For anyone who's watching, I'm so excited that, that they're now able to hear you say, you know, let's now take this focus one step further mm -hmm. and, and maybe think about your protein intake. And I love that it's 100 grams because it fits right with target 100. Well, and, and the irony is a hundred grams is where, because the average American, I think the last statistic I looked at was anywhere from 200 to 300 grams of carbs a day, most of which were processed. Yeah. So when I say to women, track your macros and get your, your carbohydrates under a hundred, sometimes people like their heads explode because they're like, how am I going to eat? Yeah. And I remind them, I'm like, listen, as you're decreasing your carbs, you're increasing your protein. It's going to work out beautifully. And I find a hundred grams is not scary. Like if I said 50 then we'd really have, you know, people would really be like, I can't do this. And I would say, yes, you can, <laughs> but hundred grams to me is workable. It's, it's reasonable. And I think being gentle and kind with ourselves is really important because it's, you'll see a fit pro out there who I'm sure is well-meaning who's 22 years old and, you know, says just count your calories. And, you know, if it fits your macros, I'm not sure if you've seen that on social media. Yeah. Yeah. And it drives me crazy because they'll say if it fits your macros and like, they'll eat, I don't know, five donuts. And I'm like, Oh, I can't even imagine how bad you feel right now. <laughs> I'm dealing with that with my son right now. Cause he's, you know, 17, he's extremely mm -hmm. into to bodybuilding and he's getting his information from TikTok. So they yep. and his best friend are buying meringues because they're no fat mm -hmm. and they can have them for few calories. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is so crazy you're my child I like, know it's, it's crazy so 
So no, I think this is amazing information. Um, uh, I, I wanted to touch on the seed oils, uh, and then and then I just at some point I want to have you back so we can just talk about all that the the processed food industry and and what is happening. I mean, I think again, I have been this really hopeful door opener to a mm -hmm. a very different way of thinking about weight loss and wellness in terms of like making it gentle and kind, removing diet mentality, learning habit formation in these six pillars, creating a community that's all speaking the same language. And it's so lovely to hear you as an expert coming in and speaking that same language, because sometimes you do get somebody who's an expert who isn't connected to it themselves. And we can see and feel that you're actually doing this and you've been working your way up to where you are now and that no one needs to be where you are. They need to find out and, and you say the word bioindividuality, which is so important, is that people, you know, it's why we give the tools, the worksheets and the, the educational courses that we do is to make sure that people understand that this is a journey, right? And, and to take a, a piece like that today, the last thing I was going to ask you about is, are the seed oils just like a high level? I think, you know, um, just just a few things that people can avoid. You know, I heard you on a TED talk and um, you were talking about Trader Joe's and calling it Trader Junk. junk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get, I generally get some hate, hate DMs after that, but it's just, it's, <laughs> I always go into whether it's Costco or Trader Joe's with an open mind. And then like Trader Joe's pretty consistently, unless you're eating, you know, fruits or vegetables, just about everything else has junk in it. So Seed oils are a byproduct of the processed food industry. There's no nutritive value there. Um, if you do nothing else after watching this, start reading food labels and realize that they are in everything. That's why soybean oil is the number one consumed fat in the United States. So this would incorporate things like soybean, canola, cottonseed, sunflower, safflower, et cetera. Dr. Kate Shanahan is a recognized expert in this area, and she has a really great list of research on her website. So if you're a doubter and you want to like read the research on seed oils, um, that's absolutely there. But we know that they're highly inflammatory, often rancid. They're exposed to toxic solvents and chemicals. So go to YouTube and Google, how is canola oil made? It'll cure you of any desire to ever consume it ever again. It's disgusting. And it's the understanding that they're cheap and that's why the processed food industry uses them. So when you go to restaurants, sometimes your hundred dollar steak is fried in seed oils. Um, ben Azadi and I were talking, uh, we, he's a, a expert friend of mine that's in the keto space. And he said, he started telling restaurants that he was allergic to seed oils. And I said, oh, that's brilliant. I've used that a few times. It works very effectively. They take you very seriously, but most of this, you know, most of your meat is cooked in seed oils. You're you can almost be guaranteed any uh, salad dressing you receive in a restaurant is in, it has seed oils incorporated in it. And the concern is that it, it actually um, is there, creates a lot of oxidative stress and inflammation. It damages our cell membranes for up to two years, which is really disturbing. And worse yet, uh, Dr. Kate's uh, research is demonstrating that it actually drives the desire for more carbohydrates. And then further dysregulates your insulin and your blood sugar. And so if, if you take nothing else away, just really understanding how much is in our food supply and how, you know, just removing seed oils, for many people, just removing seed oils or avoiding them as much as you possibly can, can be life-changing. Because the one thing to remember about fats is that they are much more, uh, they're much more nutrient dense than uh, uh, protein or carbohydrates. So four calories per gram for protein and carbs and nine calories per gram for fat. So a little bit of fat has a lot of energy in there that your body has to you know, process. So just understanding that, that removing seed oils alone can be the single most important thing you do in regards to nutrition before anything else, before you go gluten-free or remove dairy or stop drinking alcohol, just the seed oils. And it's hard. It's, it's navigating a crazy world. Yeah, I was going to say like just top five ways in which they would see that appear on a, on a nutrition label. Well, yeah, it usually will say soybean oil. It'll, you know, soy protein isolate, uh, canola oil, cottonseed, sunflower, safflower. And the worst thing is now 
the manufacturers are getting savvy. And so they're like, oh, well, we don't want to say soybean or canola. So we're going to say sunflower or safflower. Or then I get DMs from people saying, if it's, uh, you know, cold pressed, does that make it any better? I'm like, no, it actually doesn't. So just, so even if you go to Whole Foods, even if you're looking at salad dressings, like there's only a couple of brands that don't have them in it. Like Chosen is one. Um, I end up making a lot of my dressings at home. Every once in a while, I like a pre-made dressing just because I'm a normal person. But if you do nothing else, read the food labels because you will be stunned to see how much they, I mean, even in like organic things, they're just, they're proliferative. It's like almost like a -a whack-a-mole. Like just when you think you've figured it out, then you find there and everything else. It's just, it's like sugar, right? When they figured out that we were looking at the sugar, all of a sudden they gave it 65 other names. Mm -hmm hit it in different ways. So you've got to be a little bit savvy. Um, I think we have some incredible takeaways from you today and I appreciate your time. You're um, welcome. For everyone, um, you know, it's it's remembering to stay curious, on honor, honor your body every day uh, for sure. Um, really look into that protein consumption if you can. Um, you're, you're giving us that hundred-ish uh, goal at some point um, is, is big. If there's nothing else we take away from today, uh, really focus on finding the seed oils and removing them as well Um, and staying, uh, you know, uh, very, very metabolically flexible and uh, keeping our neuroplasticity. Awesome. It's been a pleasure connecting with you and your community. Yay. Well, thank you. Thank you. We will send this out and uh, show it to all, all the folks. Thank you. All right. Have a great day, Cynthia. You too. Great. Bye.